Rosalind Elsie Franklin was born in Notting Hill, England on July 25, 1920. As a child, she was exceptionally smart. Her aunt described her as alarmingly clever. She spends all her time doing arithmetic for pleasure and invariably gets her sums right. Rosalind was always at the top of her classes, and by age 15, she knew what she wanted to be a scientist. At 17, she had the highest marks in chemistry on her Cambridge exams, winning her a seat at Newnham College, where she focused on physical chemistry and crystallography. A year after receiving her PhD in physical chemistry, Rosalind started working in Paris, where she learned about X-ray diffraction techniques and investigated why only some carbons turned into graphite with heat. She discovered that at the molecular level, pores and coal have small constrictions, which increase with heating and change according to the coal's carbon content. These pores let the coal act like a strainer, allowing certain substances to pass through making some more permeable than others. Rosalind was the first to identify and measure these pores, making it possible to classify coals and predict their performance very precisely. In 1951, she began researching DNA in John Randall's laboratory at King's College. He had told Rosalind that she would be working with a graduate student named Raymond Gosling, but neglected to mention that another scientist named Maurice Wilkins would also be studying alongside her. Upon meeting Rosalind, Maurice instantly assumed that she was his assistant, not the head of her own research project. Their relationship only got worse from there. Previous scientists had struggled to get good photographs of DNA, but Rosalind and Raymond were able to get two sets of high-resolution photos of crystallized DNA fibers by varying the temperature and humidity of the samples. It all made sense now. Prior scientists' samples were a mixture of the two forms. This was when Rosalind took the famous Photograph 51. Rosalind eagerly presented her findings at a conference that James Watson, another scientist, attended. James and his colleague, Francis Crick, were racing against others to figure out the model of DNA. But when they tried to make one based off of the information James remembered from the conference and invited Rosalind to look at it, she was shocked at how inaccurate it was. They had placed the phosphates on the inside of the helix where they wouldn't be able to absorb water the way her research had demonstrated. Rosalind wasn't very interested in building speculative models. She just wanted the facts. Another heated argument broke out between Rosalind and Maurice, so the lab was divided. Rosalind would analyze form A, and Maurice would analyze form B. Her distrust in Maurice forced her to keep her data close, and soon, feeling very unhappy, she left for a position at Burbank College. Once she left, unknown to Rosalind, Maurice showed photograph 51 to James and Francis, helping them unlock the secret to DNA. As a chemist, Rosalind knew hydrophobic bases should be inside for protection and hydrophilic phosphates and sugar should be outside. But James and Francis kept switching the two, which was illogical. Once Francis saw Rosalind's MRC report, where she proposed inner phosphate distances, he couldn't argue with her conclusions anymore. This crucial information, along with their discovery of base pairing, allowed them to finally complete their DNA model. Even though Rosalind's breakthroughs were integral to their discovery, they credited unpublished experimental results and ideas of Dr. M. H. F. Wilkins, Dr. R. E. Franklin, and their co-workers at King's College London, undermining her contribution. At Burbeck College, Rosalind focused on tobacco mosaic virus, which causes tobacco leaves to curl and discolor in patches. Because TMV is a simple, stable, and highly infectious organism, it was a perfect model for virus studies. Rosalind's job was to investigate RNA's role in virus reproduction. If she could understand virus structures, she could then try to learn how they cause disease. In 1956, working with Aaron Klug, Kenneth Holmes, and John Finch, Rosalind used a technique called isomorphous replacement to substitute atoms of a heavy element into the virus protein. The new atoms changed the x-ray patterns found in photographs, and analysis of the differences revealed the concealed structure. This experiment determined that the RNA of the virus, instead of floating freely, was embedded in a groove between protein subunits in the winding wall. Once they knew where the components were, the team built a model of the virus. Then, they extended their studies to other plant viruses. During her trip around America, everyone was so impressed by her model that there was a request to exhibit it at an upcoming Brussels World Fair. However, Rosalind began to experience sharp abdominal pains and swelling, and upon her return to England, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The following year, she worked as much as possible, but in 1958, the cancer advanced again, and Rosalind died in April at 37 years old. Her old graduate student, Raymond, hypothesized that the cancer was caused by Rosalind's dedication to getting quality pictures of DNA because she spent hours adjusting the specimen in an active x-ray beam. In 1962, Francis, James, and Maurice were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Because it isn't awarded posthumously, Rosalind wasn't considered for the award. However, it's unclear if she would have been included even if she was still alive. Despite society's overall disregard for her contribution to DNA, she still made several fundamental scientific discoveries. As J.D. Bernal, a pioneer in crystallography, once said, Miss Franklin was distinguished by extreme clarity and perfection in everything she undertook. Her photographs are among the most beautiful x-ray photographs of any substance ever taken. Her life was a perfect example of single-minded devotion to research.